Good opportunity for us to talk to John Kirby, the uh, National Security uh, Council Coordinator for Strategic Communications. What you might not know about Mr. Kirby, uh, he has ample Navy experience, which is connected to the water, which is kind of a nice added bonus here to talk about these things. He, uh, back to September 1986, 28 years in the Navy before retiring mm -hmm. in 2015, the rank of Rear Admiral. A lot of people do not know that, so he knows of what he speaks. Um, Admiral, very good to see you. Uh, What's going on now has people of all sorts appreciating the power of water and rain and all of that stuff. But, uh, you know, Florida needs a lot of help. The president's committed to providing it. But this looks like a multi-billion dollar storm uh, and it could go up considerably. What do you think? Yeah, it's difficult right now, Neil, to estimate exactly how much is going to be required from the federal government, certainly from state and, and local governments as well in terms of financing. But you heard the president uh, we're going to stick with the people of Florida. We're going to do everything that we can, and resources are not going to be the long pole in the tent. The other thing that we're doing is working very closely with uh, with inside the interagency, FEMA, DOD, uh, as as well as the, the DHS, the, the Coast Guard particularly, uh, with state and local authorities to make sure that they have the help they need in terms of manpower and equipment now. And so you've got uh, thousands of Coast Guardsmen and women that are uh, that are already conducting rescues. You have more than almost 5,000 National Guard troops from four different states, one of which is, of course, Florida, uh, on the ground right now that are conducting rescues and uh, trying to do uh, clearing uh, uh, operations. So there is a lot of resources being applied. And, and as President Biden said, Neil, uh, if there's more that's required, the, the United States government will, will do that. Um, I, I, maybe while I have you, John, as well, uh, the president had uh, made a point yesterday of saying, and, and you know, a warning to U.S. oil and gas companies, don't even think about taking advantage of this or, or you know, uh, fooling around yeah. with prices or essentially gouging. And yet there's been no evidence of that. And why did he say that? I think the president wanted to make it very clear um, uh, to them as well as to the, 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 the good people of Florida that, that he wants uh, the residents of Florida to get up back up on their feet as quickly as possible, as smoothly and as efficiently as possible. Um, and he didn't want to see anybody trying to take advantage uh, of the, the, the dire straits that these people are but in. That hasn't and happened, it's not right? just John, it, it hasn't happened. I'm just wondering, I, there's been a run on, on, on gas stations that run out of gas. So that's not the gas company's fault. I'm just wondering where that came from. Yeah. I, I think he just wanted to lay down a marker, Neil. I think he felt it was really important uh, that the people of Florida know that the president uh, and the federal government is behind them, and we're going to do everything we can to help them back on their feet. And that includes being watchful and mindful and vigilant about anybody that might try to take advantage of the situation. But do you think it just adds an element of suspicion that people say, all right, you know, gas prices has, have, you know, the last eight, nine days been running up, that he was throwing it out there that it might not be, uh, you know, just a matter of supply and demand, that these, these guys could be working to gouge him? Was he throwing that out there? No, no. I look again. I think this came from the heart. This came from a president who cares about the people of Florida, wants to make sure that they're getting all the support that they need. No, I, I see what you're saying there, but it's sort of like asking them how long you've been beating your wife. How do, how do these guys defend themselves and say it's not happening? We, we haven't seen that happen, and we don't want to see that happen. And I think the president wanted to lay down a marker that, that we're going to be watching for this, that this is not the time to be trying to profiteer uh, off other people's tragedies. All right. Um, again, no evidence that is going on, but we'll see. Uh, let me switch gears a little, if you don't mind. I want to get back to Ukraine as well, uh, because uh, yeah. Vladimir Putin has said on annexing these these zones uh, that, uh, uh, you know, could represent up to a quarter of the size of Ukraine uh, on these bogus uh, surveys that show, uh, you know, overwhelming support for doing so by 95 percent. Um, first of all, do you trust those surveys? They seem pretty bogus. Uh, but what did you make of that? And what are we going to do? No. Of course, we don't trust them. You know, we we knew, and we talked about this several weeks ago, that the Russians were going to conduct these sham referenda. They were going to rig the results. In fact, uh, you know, they they most likely rigged these results even before votes were cast, uh, so that it would come up with the majority voting for uh, annexation uh, to Russia. This is what we expected them to do. It is simply Mr. Putin trying to put a fig leaf of political political legitimacy uh, on a military campaign that he knows is desperately struggling and is not going uh, as well as he wants it to go. Uh, obviously, we're not going to recognize this. The people of Ukraine are not going to recognize these results, and nothing's going to change about the support that we're going to continue to give Ukraine going forward. Right, were you surprised that if you're going to rig an election or a survey or a finding that uh, you, you, you want to make it look somewhat believable, let's say maybe 55 percent, 60 percent, but the 95 percent just kind of... 
I don't know. I, I, I don't think yeah. Jesus got yeah, that support, you're... right? <laughs> I think you're giving the Kremlin too much credit for uh, for their cleverness here. Uh, I mean, again, we knew they were going to rig this, um, and clearly, Mr. Putin wanted to make uh, make the appearance. Uh, that the vast majority of people living in these areas want to be part of Russia. Uh, so they, they set these numbers pretty high. Um, but you're right. I mean, it does, it, it, it almost becomes even more obvious how rigged it is. I don't think Mr. Putin cares that we know it's rigged. I think he's still going to claim in his own mind uh, and inside his own government that these are legitimate results uh, and use them as, as again, to, to gain some sort of legitimacy over uh, territories inside Ukraine that he can't get otherwise. But he's, he's going to go through with it. Uh, and I, I know that President Zelensky in Ukraine has called for an emergency meeting with his top security defense officials to see what they can do. But it looks like, um, you know, Putin will be the guest who won't leave. And, and in fact, will make that part of Russia and not Ukraine. It's never going to be part of uh, uh, Russia, no matter what these referenda votes come in looking like. Uh, it's always going to be Ukraine. We've made that clear. Certainly, President Zelensky has made that clear. But you raise a good point, Neil, and that is that it is yet another sign that Mr. Putin has no desires to sit down at the negotiating table and work a way out of this war. Now, obviously, he could end it today by leaving. That's not going to happen. But it's another indication that he's just doubling down. Uh, that he knows he's in a, a, a position uh, of weakness, not strength, uh, and he's doubling down on that to try to, again, gain some sort of legitimacy, some sort of foothold uh, to claim uh, that he actually needs to be inside Ukraine. Um, you know, we've been seeing these protests back in Russia, forget Ukraine, uh, you know, since he signed up or wants to sign up 300,000 reservists on, on top of the 137,000 additional soldiers who he says uh, should come to Ukraine to fight the good fight. Now, obviously, given the response from some of these uh, reservists, um, they don't want anything to do with it. Uh, violent incidents at a number of recruiting stations, uh, tens of thousands sending on various borders to get the heck out of the country. Is, is he running in, into a real problem back home? Or are we prepared for the possibility he's toppled? Well, we, he certainly is under more pressure now, both internally and externally. You're talking about the internal dissent, and that is noteworthy. Uh, that you have uh, all these protests and these uh, young men who are refusing to follow these orders, uh, that's not something he's used to. He is not able anymore to obscure the war in Ukraine from the people of Russia. He's been able to hide it from them, to lie to them, to obscure it, uh, to, to keep it from them, and that's, uh, that's not as possible anymore now that he has to go to some sort of partial mobilization. You've also been seeing internally in, in Russia some elected municipal officials in the last couple of weeks publicly calling on the Kremlin to stop this war. And externally, Neil, he's also facing pressure. Uh, he really felt that he would have at least the tacit support of India and China. But at uh, two weeks ago uh, in Kyrgyzstan, uh, both President Xi and Prime Minister Modi, Prime Minister Modi of, uh, of uh, India called him out publicly and expressed concerns uh, over what he's doing inside uh, Ukraine. So uh, he's losing support both internally and externally. He feels under pressure. And I think that's why you're seeing these referenda being called uh, for, for this week. I think that's why he's leaning on mobilization, because he knows he's under more pressure. Well, there are a lot of crazy confluence of events, right, John? I mean, I'm talking now about this latest, I believe, the fourth uh, Nord Stream uh, leak. Uh, and, and it seems that Europeans yeah. are convinced that this, this is sabotaged by the Russians. Um, is it? Yeah, well, we've seen we, we've seen uh, the reports. We certainly have seen uh, the, the comments by our, our, our European allies and par European allies and partners. Pardon me. Uh, we're taking a look at this. Obviously, we uh, we want to get uh, ground truth. Uh, it certainly can't rule out the fact uh, that it could be sabotaged by the Russians. It's just another would be if so, if so would be just another example of how Mr. Putin is weaponizing energy. Now, back and finally, you've been very patient, but on this annexation thing on the part of Vladimir Putin, do you think that could be a way for him? to say, all right, I'll leave if these territories I can annex, much like he did, you know, uh, back during the Obama administration when he essentially did the same with Crimea. Yeah, you I mean, is, could it be some sort of bargaining chip at the yes. table? Uh, give, me this and then, give me this and no more, right? Um, it's possible. Nobody knows exactly what Mr. Putin's thinking here. That said, uh, Mr. Zelensky has been very clear. Uh, Ukraine is U Ukraine. All these territories are Ukraine. Um, and he's going to fight for every inch of Ukraine, as is his right to do as commander in chief. And we respect that. That's why we're not going to recognize these ourselves. 
uh, and we are certainly going to continue to support Ukraine in the field with whatever systems and capabilities they need to to win back their 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 rightful territory. All right. So we, of course, backing them with military aid and cash and a lot of things that they desperately need. That is Ukraine. Uh, we would not say to, to President Zelensky, um, this is one good way of, of, of ending this war. Yeah. Give him something and he'll go away. We're not going to dictate the terms of negotiation to President Zelensky. He gets to determine uh, what success looks like. He gets to determine if and when and how he's ready to sit down with President Putin and negotiate an end of this war. Obviously, we all want to see it end, and we'd like to see it end today. Certainly, a diplomatic path forward is the best way. But President Zelensky gets to make those decisions. If he wants advice and counsel, clearly, as we've been doing for seven months, we'll provide that. But we're not going to dictate the terms to him. Um, I lied when I said it was my last question. I, I know the president is just about wrapping up his meeting with FEMA and that he's working uh, very well with the, you know, uh, the powers that be, including the Republican governor, Republican and Democratic mayors. Um, so it does show some hope to getting you know, this, this fixed and, and cleaned up uh, and, and soon. But of course, the reality is that uh, you know, money's tight in Washington, money's tight for FEMA. Uh, we're running you know, at, at a time the economy could be dealing with much higher interest rates. That is going to put a pinch, certainly, on American activity. So it, is it, in your eyes, an environment where we can afford what we're doing, uh, that, that, that this is such a problem now, and maybe a $40 billion problem for property, casualty insurers, and the like, yeah. that the government's going to have to do more, uh, but it doesn't have the money to do more? I don't know that we can afford to, to not do what we have to do to help Florida get back on its feet. I mean, Florida is a huge economic driver uh, from, from uh, tourism to, to, to seafood to high tech, uh, you name it, the, the sector Florida is involved. Um, it's a very important state economically. And uh, I just don't know that we can afford not to do what is required uh, to, to help Florida get back up on its feet. The president's committed to that um, and, and we'll stay at it. All right. Well, watch very closely. John Kirby, very good seeing you again. Thank you. Thank you, Neil.